Welcome everyone to a webinar entitled Principles of Change, Teresa of Avila's Carmelite Reform and Insights from Change Management with presenter, Dr. Christina R. Olson. My name is Sebastian Mafud, and I'm the director of ITEST. The Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, ITEST, is an association of theologians, scientists, and others committed to a Catholic worldview in which faith and science collaborate in exploring the truth. ITEST explores truth theologically in the wisdom traditions of the human community and in the data studied in the sciences. ITEST's mission is to foster and disseminate the Catholic position that science and faith in God are complementary paths to human fulfillment. Before I introduce our presenter, Father Vincent Uke, retired priest of the Diocese of Trenton, New Jersey, will offer our opening prayer. Father Uke. Let us pray. If we allow Christ to dwell in us, he will enable us to do what we thought we couldn't do. He will become our friend and use us as his instruments to lead us more, to lead more people into his kingdom. St. Teresa of Avila came to understand that not only did God love us first, but he desires us to love him so that we can do extraordinary things to build up the church and with grace, with his grace and gifts to reconstruct the world. May her example show us the way to guide us into making this world into the kingdom that God intends it to be. God has granted many reformers to make the church work. St. Teresa of Avila is one of them. Her cooperation with God's grace not only made her a model for contemplative prayer, but also a great reformer that has preserved the Carmelite order to this day. To the general public, we only were only taught that she was a very holy woman. May she share with us through her intercession a prayer life to boldly manage our responsibilities to build up our church in our times. May our discussion today remind us of her relevance in a so badly needed church today. Through her intercession, help us to make us a prayerful church so that we can be instruments to rebuild what, we, what was lost and gain a new and better way of conducting our affairs in a spiritual way so to attract all people who see the wisdom found in Catholic ethics. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father Yuk. And now I'm delighted to introduce our presenter, Dr. Christina Olson, author of four books published by Enroute Books and Media, including Principles of Change, God's Memoir, My Catholic Conversion, and For the Love of God. She has a PhD in Theology, Spirituality from Catholic University of America, a DBA in Business Administration from the University of Maryland, and an MS in Computer Science from Northwestern University. She also has certifications in project management and change management. She is retired from Bell Laboratories, where she was a member of the technical staff. Currently, she works in the Office of Innovation and Technology at the City of Philadelphia. She also teaches courses in theology, business, and information technology at several universities. She is a member of the Secular Order of Discalced Carmelites. Christina, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahfoud. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much also, Father Yud, for your wonderful opening prayer. Um, it really did highlight how Teresa not only is a great leader uh, spiritually with her, um, her insights from books such as The Interior Castle and The Way of Perfection, but also she had a lot of man, uh, manage, managerial skills and administrative skills that she put to work to um, enable this reform. So let's get right into the uh, the webinar. This webinar explores Teresa of Jesus's approach to the Carmelite reform of the 16th century, and we examine her reform through the lens of modern day change management theory and practice in four main areas, leadership and purpose, governance and usefulness, attitudes, feelings and resistance, and then social support. 
Her reform principles really are very similar to information technology leadership today. And we can learn from both of them how to benefit our organizations today. So I hope you will uh, go away from this webinar with some ideas and, and, and best practices for um, working in your organizations, whether they be uh, religious organizations, uh, churches, or other organizations. Um, Dr. Mafu did uh, kindly share my background. I just want to highlight here that um, there are two dissertations associated with my two very, very different doctorate, uh, doctorates. And I wish I could highlight this without that little window coming up. Um, and one is the first one in, in spirituality at Catholic U, the title was Work in the Spirituality of Teresa of Avila. I studied the role of work in her life, which included administrative work. We might think of the work of prayer, um, you know, leading others, um, leading the reform, uh, sweeping the floor, doing spinning, and guiding the work of the people that that she lived with, the, the nuns who were uh, in her in her monasteries. Um, and then the the IT, uh, the business administration uh, area of research that I studied was in information technology rollouts that I've been involved with really for uh, decades on and off. And right now in the city of Philadelphia, we are rolling out a large system that uh, will impact the financial and procurement systems in the city. It's a multi-year project. And um, so I'm right in, right in the middle of it as, as the uh, change management lead for that project. But in this research, I wanted to understand what more about the attitudes of the change recipients, the people who would be needing to use this new software. What role does their attitude play in the acceptance or non-acceptance of the software. So we'll talk about these two things. The, this, uh, the book um, was an effort, was my effort to try to take lessons from both sides of the, of the coin and, and try to see what each approach might teach the other. So let's start with leadership and purpose. Now, um, Teresa led in, in a very collaborative style. She discussed the issues that she was finding, uh, some of the issues with the Carmelite Order of with, um, with nuns, uh, with her friends, with um, spiritual directors and people she would call uh, learned men and spiritual uh, leaders, and developed a plan and actions to move the reform forward with all of this input. And also it gave her an opportunity to share her own ideas with these various people and and uh, sort of promote uh, a, re a return to a more rigorous uh, lifestyle, one that focused more on prayer and recollection because some laxity had crept into the system, as we'll see. So the purpose of the reform was that Teresa, rooted and grounded in prayer, resolved to promote the original Carmelite charism with greater focus on the Carmelite rule and the creation of smaller communities to foster greater recollection. The problems she had seen in her own incarnation monastery in Avila was that the monastery itself was overcrowded. There were around 200 nuns and their family members, um, a certain amount of inequality because the, the, the more, the wealthier nuns, the aristocratic nuns of which she was a member, Doña Teresa, uh, could purchase an apartment there and invite her servants or her family members to visit her. Um, so there was a loss of rec recollection, she felt, due to many visitors and also travel outside the monastery. They offered spiritual direction to people in the town, including some of the wealthier townspeople. Um, but there was a lot of poverty. There wasn't really even enough to eat in the monastery. I spoke to the chaplain there when I visited there, and he had been the chaplain there for, for 40 years and written a history of the Incarnation Monastery. I spoke in my limited Spanish, but I also bought the books and read them. And, um, you know, he just said that there was so little to eat, they would get just a little piece of bread and, and not much meat. And it was just hard to to to, to feed everyone uh, in that situation. So many of the nuns returned to their homes just to have enough to eat. So Teresa saw this and she recognized that the lack of recollection, the lack of focus on prayer was going against the original Carmelite charism. She, so she returned to an earlier version of the rule that was more restrictive and more true to the original uh, motive of the founders on Mount Carmel. 
Um, she also wanted the reform to be thoroughly uh, in alignment with leadership, the civil authorities, the church, and the Carmelite order. And as we mentioned, she gathered like-minded people together to launch the reform and established her first monastery in 1562, right there in Avila. Now switching gears a little bit, let's think about change management principles. Everett Rogers was a professor of communications at various universities, including Stanford, and he studied and researched the diffusion of innovations of all different types through social systems. He started out with agricultural innovations and wanted to see how these spread and how the changes in agriculture that were happening in the United States, uh, mostly in the Midwest, how these spread in the Midwest and then later in Latin America and South America. So he perceived this uh, as a communication system where there needed to be someone who led the change, who told people about the innovation, because you can't adopt it if you haven't heard of it. I like to think of the iPhone as an example. Each new version of the iPhone is well advertised, you know. Um, and he is the one you might have, I included this graph because you might be familiar with the term early adopters, or you might have seen this graph. He's the guy for this, uh, who determined that, um, you know, roughly two and a half percent of people will be right up front in adopting the innovation. The early adopters, another 12.5%. Um, and this is the, the normal bell curve distribution um, that we so often see. Early majority, some people wait and see their later majority, and some people really wait a long time before they adopt an innovation. But an agent of change for Rogers must uh, do the following things. Be, uh, be willing to foster the intent to change in the people that they have contact with and establish relationships with those people who will be adopting the change. Um, the agent of change needs to diagnose a problem and understand what the problem is in that group and how this innovation might help that situation, and then translate intentions into actions and put the system into place. So we can see the connection here with how these change management principles apply to Teresa's reform. Uh, in, we want to solve a problem in the organization, and Teresa did diagnose a, a significant problem, overcrowding and lack of recollection in monasteries, which by the way, wasn't only a Carmelite problem. There was uh, a, a lack, a, there was a return during the Catholic counter-reformation after the Protestant Reformation. You might recall in 1517, that's when Martin Luther uh, posted his um, uh, 95 thesis on the church door at Wittenberg. Um, and after that, there, the Catholic, even before that, the Catholics, uh, Catholic Church had been looking at itself and examining religious organizations and putting into place some reform measures. Um, one leading figure in the Franciscan order, for example, was St. Peter of Alcantara, who was also a spiritual guide for St. Teresa. So um, he influenced to do a, a, you know, poverty and a more ascetic lifestyle. But anyway, she saw this problem. She then we need to choose a solution. Our solution was really to return to an earlier rule and establish smaller communities with greater equality. Um, then we need to deploy the change. In IT, we deploy the technical aspects and we install the system. And then in Teresa's day, she had a lot of administrative work to do to obtain approvals, buy property, renovate houses. Sometimes she would rent a house first and bring the nuns there to a new city and then while there, find a house to buy, maybe renovate that. It needed to be suitable for a chapel. It needed to be healthy for the nuns. In one case, she moved a monastery back from the river in Salamanca to a higher place on the hill because the nuns were getting sick from the humid air. So it's that's uh, those are technical, you know, challenges, practical challenges. Then she needed to foster adoption of the change uh, and train the users. In information technology, we, we spread the word and we provide training on the new software system. In her case, she needed to persuade officials and she talked with many like-minded others. And then she established a system of guidance for, for the monasteries that would keep them all sort of on the same page, um, which is something we have to do in IT as well. We need to reinforce the new processes and establish the rules of governance. Um, security roles in an IT system are important, for example, the business processes, the number of approvals each step takes, and different things within a software system. In, a, in Teresa's reform, she, her administrative writings were very important. 
she wrote the constitutions and another document called On Making the Visitation, which advised the apostolic visitators how they should visit and review the monasteries in the Carmelite order, which was pretty bold, I think. And we'll look at a, a little bit of what she included there. But it was important to her to keep the different monasteries. We might think of them in a current day as sort of like branch locations or uh, the franchise model in a way uh, to keep to keep each monastery um, in the same charism of the order and to preserve that she had a strong reliance on the Carmelite rule, the constitutions um, and other administrative um, documents. Here's the incarnation uh, monastery in Avila. I just thought you might like to see what it looks like. Um, it's pretty big here. It's the large building here in the front. When I visited it, there were 29 nuns, many fewer than uh, the 200 who had lived there before. There's a large um, you know, chapel over here. And I just thought you'd like to see it. Um, we've already talked about what some of the problems were. Um, and so we'll move on. Let's think about governance and usefulness. And I, I like this picture um, of the Al Alcazar Castle in Segovia, Spain. I just want to mention here that from this view, if you were to turn around and go across the street and you know down a little ways, you would come to the chapel that St. John of the Cross uh, used and uh, was in so much, and the hillside where he liked to go up and, and meditate. And his remains are still there to this day. Um, in terms of governance and usefulness, as we mentioned, Teresa wrote documents that assisted with governance. Usefulness, that's an IT term. There was a researcher, uh, Fred, Fred Davis at MIT in the 1980s, who developed a technology acceptance model that had these elements in it. Uh, perceived usefulness of the system, Perceived use of, uh, ease of use of, a, of the system. This is technology again. I'm, I'm jumping back to technology for a moment. Usefulness, ease of use, and attitude. Uh, all of these three things together tended to promote greater adoption of a system. So it has to be useful. Think in terms of software or your phone. It needs to actually help you, you know, do things, get things done. You need to be able to access your, your favorite apps on it and so forth. And it needs to be fairly intuitive. You don't want to spend a lot of time looking at a manual for use. You just want to be able to use it. And um, then all of these things kind of help help our attitude. It's like, oh, this I can do this. This isn't that hard. Um, so and the same was true, uh, perhaps for for Teresa. At least we want to think about it, think about it from that point of view. The the goal for the Carmelite spiritual life could be said to promote, um, a, you know, recollection and contemplative prayer to lead the soul to union with God. And any environment that promotes that recollection and um, prayer in community and in solitude to lead her, her nuns closer to God according to the Carmelite charism and the rule and uh, the other um, instructions associated with the Carmelite order, that's the environment she wanted to create. Not a lot of distractions, but fewer people, quieter space, where people could uh, do work that would focus them on God and and be useful to each other and and uh, uh, and to God. So that's what she did here. Um, I think I just said some of these things, except the final item here, establishing monasteries in poverty. She wanted the monasteries to be supported by the townspeople, but in rural areas that wasn't always possible. Trent had re the Council of Trent had recently approved the foundation of monasteries with an endowment, with, that is, a donation by a wealthy benefactor. Teresa was against this at first, but later came to realize again through consultations with learned others that um, this was the teaching of Trent and she wouldn't be going against any teachings uh, to do this. So she did uh, eventually accept gifts from um, some of the wealthy benefactors that wanted to donate money to her, her reform. Now, to draw some lessons out of this for our, um, our organizations today, let's just think about a few things together. So in Teresa's reform, 
we saw that uh, a healthy atmosphere that supported recollection and prayer was important. The housing of, of the nuns, the monastery buildings themselves, and their locations. The same is true today for our work locations. We need to provide working conditions that support adaptability and provide for remote work. Boy, didn't we learn about that during the pandemic, right? Um, many of us learned to work effectively at home if we weren't already doing that already. Uh, but in a larger way and in our relationships with other organizations when we had to have meetings that that involved many people from different places. So we need working conditions that support uh, our work. And then funding. We just uh, mentioned that Teresa was, uh, was focused on providing for income in a way that aligned with both church teachings and geographical context. And in today's world, we, ha we need to think about capital and budget and how we fund our enterprises. We need to support financial and accounting practices that support ongoing change in a time of technological innovation, as well as current operations, and in a way that aligns with, um, with authority. Uh, in terms of community, Teresa created a system of gov governance that supported smaller communities and good relationships. <laughs> and the same is true for our work groups today. There are studies on the optimal team size for a team. Um, I've heard around five seems to be a good size for a working team because with each new person added to the team, we have many more than one additional communication channel uh, channels to communicate to each other and it becomes a little more complex. So to think about what's the optimal um, uh, right sized work group for your organization and be able to develop good relationships. In terms of juridical considerations, Teresa did a lot of hard work in obtaining the necessary licenses, letters, and, and um, administrative authority to establish uh, um, legitimacy with existing leaders and to legitimately establish her foundations without breaking any of the rules or making anyone mad, I guess you could say too, in terms of the uh, leadership. But she really wanted to be, uh, as you know, a daughter of the church. It was very important to her to uh, conform to, to the church and the civil leaders. And for our, ourselves too, we need to be sure our organizations um, have systems in place to comply with uh, regulatory requirements, support growth. Um, we may want to consider outsourcing and also um, room for education and te technological innovations uh, as we plan in our organizations. And finally, I really like the fact that Teresa's documentation and her whole system and her travel on muleback to so many of these places um, established consistency across her foundations, establishing a common way of life with governance that ensures the consistency. She provided written guidelines, as we must do. Um, the policies that we write for our organizations are important, and uh, it's great if they can support the framework for change. Um, another thing I want to mention here is that Teresa valued reading, and she wanted each monastery to have a library, and she even specified a list of books that she wanted, uh, they, you know, certain books that in every single library because the printing press had just come out in the late uh, 1400s and here she was in the 1500s and now you can get books that were printed in Spanish and you didn't have to read them in Latin. And so this was, uh, this was something else that helped, I think, I personally think, keep everybody on the same pages, literally, in the different monasteries. Um, one of her... One of her uh, books for um, uh, oversight on making the visitation that I, I mentioned advised the apostolic visitator, visitators, and in the second bullet there, they should examine financial records and communi communities should avoid debt and spend in accordance with their means. The visitors should take note of the work the nuns are doing and encourage and thank them for their work and see that the constitutions and the rule are followed Finally, the personal qualities of new members should be valued more than money or a dowry. So she had uh, provided guidance for them in that way. Um, we, I believe, covered these items, but basically Teresa established guidelines, which embodied the principles that defined her reform, which included return to the earlier rule, smaller, more manageable communities, greater recollection, and greater equality, including uh, her statement that the priors should be first on the list for sweeping. Everybody works together. Now on to attitudes, feelings, and resistance. 
uh, very important. People have strong feelings about change, and we want to take that into account. I like this painting. So Teresa promoted a positive attitude in her reformed monasteries. Um, she recognized that not everyone would have a positive attitude and even talked about melancholia or depression, which we'll read about in a moment. Um, but it, she was uh, she even designed one monastery, and when that one was done, she was happy when the nuns were happily settled in their new locations like little lizards that come out into the sun in the summer. And uh, that was, you see those little lizards, right, in Spain going around everywhere. And uh, so anyway, I like that, that she, she really cared that her, her nuns were happily settled. Um, sometimes she encountered resistance and even fled if there was too much resistance, but she always tried to find a way around obstacles. Um, in terms of the sadness that some she saw some people feeling, she said um, in Chapter 7 of the Book of Foundations, some nuns experienced a bodily humor called melancholy, or what we might call depression. She recognized that not everyone felt it to the same degree, and uh, that nuns who really were seriously depressed could upset the whole community. So she advised the prioresses to be strict and recommend penance. Um, but the idea was um, to show love and words and deeds and to keep the depressed person uh, busy. That was the goal of, um, you know, providing them with some structure so they wouldn't, uh, so that it, it would just help them cope and uh, that they wouldn't have the opportunity to be sort of imagining things for them. She felt that that in that lay, lay much of their trouble. Um, so she had a good knowledge of human nature. And one of the places this came into play was when she established a new foundation, she kind of handpicked, you know, who would be the priors there, who would be the first nuns to establish the, the foundation in that in that new city. So it, it required a lot of uh, awareness of human nature to accomplish that. Now, uh, back to Rogers, and we, we talked a little bit about his procedure for a change agent. He had another set of um, uh, activities that has to occur when someone decides to adopt a new innovation from the recipient's point of view, the person who's going to adopt this change. So they need to know about the innovation um, then there's a period of persuasion when you or I might think about what it is we, we want to do differently or adopt or purchase, and we form our attitude. Oh, we think it's pretty good or maybe not so good. Finally, we make a decision. Okay, I'm going to get that, whether it's a car or you know a phone or a laptop or whatever it might be. And then we, we, uh, once we adopt the innovation, we put it to use. Um, or this might be a farming innovation, and they try the new, the new, I don't know, chemical on the on the on the fields or whatever it might be, and then confirmation, seeking reinforcement for the decision. You want to hear somebody say, "Great choice, well done." You analyzed all the options and you chose the best possible thing, and hopefully we can feel that way. Hopefully we did choose a good thing, and we can, um, you know, find that confirmation ourselves. So Teresa also did this. She told others about the reform. She was very persuasive at times and helped people to decide to establish the reform monasteries. We'll talk about Toledo in a moment. Um, and uh, then she reassured them that they had made a good choice and this was uh, the right thing to do. Um, now, in terms of emotions and attitudes, one of the studies I, I particularly uh, found helpful in the study of IT rollouts and um, the role of emotions and the role of attitude was this 2010 study by Baudry and Pinsonal, um, Emotions and IT Adoption, a framework for classifying emotions. Um, on the vertical, vertical uh, axis there, if we can see the change as an opportunity, we the battle is half won. Because even if on the left side there, if it's thrust upon us and we don't really have much control over this thing that's that's being uh, changed, or on the right side, if we feel we do have control over it, either way, if we see it as an opportunity, we're better off emotionally. And this is helpful for managers and leaders to know about too, because if they can help people have a sense of achievement, um, like mastery over the system, whether that be a an IT system or a 
a new rule in the monastery or a um, a change that uh, that that comes from comes from church leadership that has us has directors of religious education um, you know do things differently or perhaps require certain reports or whatever it might be. Um, if we can help people uh, uh, master whatever it is that's being asked of us, uh, asked of them, they will achieve. They will have happiness, satisfaction, pleasure, relief, and a sense of enjoyment. Or if they feel like it's a challenge, they'll be excited and be hopeful and so forth. Now, if we think of it as a threat, that's when we become more negative in our attitudes. If we are afraid we're going to lose something, whether that be our job, which can happen in IT quite frequently because automation can be seen to perhaps replace you know, human workers, hopefully we'll uh, find other, other different work for everyone. But, um, and maybe better at a higher level, they can analyze the data rather than input the data, for example. But if we, if they see it, if we see it as a threat, uh, we're going to be replaced, or maybe if I, it's a loss of status here in, here in our, my workplace, we have people who have been using the same, same software systems for, for 30 years, you know, and, uh, it's a green screen, uh, uh, deal. And they, they, they've memorized a lot of these special, specialized codes. And those won't be, be the, some of those might, might not be being used in the new system. And what, what, what new things can we help, help people, you know, find satisfying in the new opportunities that they will have? That's our challenge. But if, if people see it as a threat, they'll lose status. They'll lose, they were the expert, you know, now, now they're on the learning side. That can be a, a sense of loss. So I just wanted to share this as a helpful um, way of looking at emotions when it comes to change. Now, what about social support? Here's another great picture. <laughs> social support, the Cistercian nuns in Southwest France, all helping each other. Um, some of the people that really helped uh, Teresa in her reform uh, are, are, are the following. St. John of the Cross, of course, uh, a Carmelite spiritual leader and very much a great help to Teresa. He also served as spiritual director and confessor for the nuns. Uh, Father Geronimo Gracian, a Carmelite priest who was very active in Teresa's reform, including uh, advocating for a separate province for discalced reformed monasteries that did come about, but not until later. And it was a tough battle, but it proved to be the best solution for some of the resistance and, um, uh, you know, differences that were, that were being discussed uh, within the order. Doña Luisa de la Cerda was Teresa's friend, a wealthy widow uh, from Toledo, who provided funding for the Malagón Monastery and I believe other funding as well. She had a great deal of support for the reform and was one of Teresa's good friends. Anne of St. Bartholomew was Teresa's longtime friend, nurse, and secretary. Um, yes. And then, uh, of course, we mentioned the Carmelite nuns from the Incarnation Monastery worked with her. There's a Dominican, uh, Father Domingo Banez, who has played a, uh, a very important role in defending Teresa's approach uh, to the civil authorities in Avila when the civil authorities were against oh one more you know one more mo monastery that we that the townspeople would have to donate to. He got up and pointed out that this this particular monastery with uh, re emphasis on recollect recollection, a return to the earlier rule, uh, and so forth, would be a great benefit to the city. And uh, that was Teresa's first monastery, St. San Jose in Avila. I mean, if that one hadn't been founded, maybe the other ones wouldn't have either. That was a really important first step for her. And uh, now some people you might not be thinking of necessarily. Roque de Huerta was the chief forest guard for the king in Madrid. I was surprised to learn that the king had a chief forest guard. So, um, but he was very much on Teresa's side and helped with communications and information, uh, which helped secure the king's support. I mean, at one point, Ter Teresa even wrote a letter to the king. And um, Padre Gracian's relatives also worked in that circle with the king. So there were some people kind of on the inside, if you will, that helped Teresa. This person named Andrada was a student in Toledo who helped Teresa find a house for the first monastery there. And um, there was also someone in the church that helped her gain, in a, in a church nearby, uh, the governor's house that helped Teresa gain an audience with the governor. I just want to briefly mention here that Andrada was a very, uh, was sent to her by a very holy Franciscan friar when no one else of her friends could find a house in Toledo. Uh, it's important to say that. 
But that friar sent her a young man named Andrada, by no means rich but very poor, asking him to do everything that I told him. I, meaning Teresa, mentioned him to my companions. They laughed very much at me and told me not to do such a thing. But right away, the day after the next, he came to speak to me and said that he already had the house, he had the keys, it was nearby, and we should go to see it. And this we did. It was so nice, we stayed in it for almost a year. So let's not underestimate the importance of all the people in the organization who want to help us, uh, no matter who they are, and they can be a very great help. So in conclusion, what we can do um, in these four areas, leadership and purpose, keep a strong focus on our purpose, and persuade others why the change is beneficial. Governance and usefulness, establish well-ordered rules of governance in our organization, and be sure our approach is truly useful to its members. Attitudes, feelings, and resistance, generate enthusiasm, encourage mastery, address negative feelings, and consider all options when dealing with resistance. And then social support, engage others who will help us to support the change, including members from all levels of the organization. I do have references here uh, for the images. There's a picture of Avila at dusk. And here are some more image references. But what I really want to show you is this picture from the 14th century Basilica in Avila, San Vicente. But to me, if you look closely, uh, it really looks like two guys checking out their iPhone. I mean, that's what uh, impressed me about, about this, uh, this sculpture here. Um, so thank you very much. The book is available on the Anu Books and Media website. Um, and by the way, it's also available in Spanish. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Very cool, Dr. Olson. That was excellent. Thank you for that presentation. And now we will entertain questions for our participants. I test administrative assistant and board member Sheila Roth will now moderate the Q&A. Sheila, take it away. All right. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, Dr. Olson, for your uh, great presentation. We have a few questions. The first question we have is from Paul Segura. And he said, thank you, Dr. Olson, for this presentation. Having worked in configuration, change management, and aerospace and rollout of new IT engineering tools, I have found the adoption phase to be the hardest. Culture change is difficult. What level of governance is needed to successfully drive major change? I love the question, and I, I, Paul, I wish you'd, you'd tell us because it's that it's such a major a major challenge. Um, what level of governance uh, in my in our situation? We do have commissioners. We're we're a city government, so we have commissioners. Uh, you know, interested in our change. We have. Um, to me, I think the important thing is to have a high a high level of governance, uh, you know, executive leadership from all of the, um, maybe not every department, but all of the major departments that are going to be influenced by the change. In our case, it's procurement and finance. When I worked at Bell Labs, um, you know, the, the executive executive leadership promoting the change was extremely important. The other, the other place I draw from uh, that I, I don't know you may you may uh, also perhaps remember quality circles, total quality management, and uh, the importance of the people working in those areas being able to contribute their ideas of how the change would be helpful. And so um, anything that that uh, contributes to the the buy, not only the buy in which which is um, but the sincere buy in. In other words. Of the of the recipients that they get an opportunity to really share what they feel will be beneficial and useful, so that that feedback can be taken in into consideration. And then, yes, it generates a positive attitude because they've been included. But um, that's that's my take. I don't know if if we want to have a conversation at this point, Paul, or if you have some guidance for us as well. And, and if if not, that's fine. We can just move on to the next question. Thank you very much for that question. Okay, thank you. Another question from Paul Segura. The spiritual part of community played a key role with St. Teresa's changes. How could that be translated to the business and secular world? Uh, that is another great question. Um, sometimes non-verbally, um, just by being, by being present to people. Um, but 
one one course I, I teach that I'm going to try to remember the, the lessons learned from is called Spirituality in the Workplace. And um, what we talk about there is a lot, allowing people the space to have an opportunity to practice their spirituality in the workplace. And this this may involve being very in inclusive and being aware of people of different faiths, uh, allowing room for spirituality in a, in a multi-faith setting. So, for example, um, my one of the uh, one of my subject matter experts for this uh, IT dissertation was a, a devout Lutheran senior v VP at Lockheed Martin, and he they were putting a chapel in there for for some of the people that that worked there. Uh, he himself has religious art on his wall in his, you know, senior VP large office include, um, you know, Christ in the boat during the storm. That's one of his favorite paintings and a large uh, picture of the Pieta, uh, very devoted to Mary, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a conservative Lutheran. And anyway, um, that's how he handles it. it spirituality in the workplace. It, people could be invited to feel comfortable there. Another thing I think is ethics. And um, I'll draw again from, from Dr. Leo McKay there, who um, they have a strong ethics program called Voicing, the, Voicing Your Values. So they do encourage discussions about ethics uh, you know, in the work environment. Um, I, I have to mention that I had uh, priests from North Vietnam in my class this summer at Catholic U in the DMIN program and spirituality in the workplace. And for them to say, you know, expressing my Catholic faith in the marketplace was a major, had a major impact on me to think about that because um, it, it's hard for some of us in the States to express our Catholic faith, faith in the workplace sometimes. And, but think of what it might be like in a communist country where atheism is, is promoted. So um, those are some thoughts I have on that, um, you know different different ways. I'm sure there are lots of other things that, that could be said, but thank you for the for your question. Great question. Very good. Thank you. Another question. Did Teresa have any prior experience with administration before her reform activities? You know that that's a great question. Uh, as a matter of fact she did. Um, she was at home until age 20. Her mother died when she was 13. And her father wasn't really great at managing the holdings. Um, they had land holdings in a town outside of Avila called Dotorandura, a large farm. And if you go there, you can see the 16th century farm implements there, which are really interesting to look at. Um, and But Teresa kept the books after her mother died and her sister left. Her sister got married and left. And um, so she was the administrator of the land holdings and the farming um, you know, buying and selling what was produced on the farm and so forth, uh, up up until she entered um, entered the Carmelite order. Let's see, uh, at, in 1515 to 1535. So at about age 20, uh, in 1535, she entered the Carmelite order. So yes, as a young woman, she did have experience in administrative activities. And the other thing I guess I could mention here is that, sadly, her grandfather came from the, the city of Toledo after having been um, forced, really, to convert to Catholicism from Judaism. He was a textile merchant and ran a business. And Teresa's father then and his brothers, uh, they all, everyone moved to Avila after that and um, also became uh, textile merchants, I believe. But in any case, the part I'm, that's coming to mind right now is how much work they did to um, get legal lugiesa um, de sangre, cleanness of blood, as it were, not to be regarded as Jewish. Um, her father married a, a Christian woman, which um, provided that safety, if you will. But they had been so persecuted earlier that Teresa would have been familiar, I believe, with legal battles and how important it was to get the necessary approvals uh, for things. And um, so I believe that gave her maybe sort of a background foundation of, uh, yes, it's, it might be difficult to, to sort of fight the battle to get the necessary approval, but it, it was a good thing to do. And, sh and she, she was willing to do that, as we see in her efforts for the reform. Wonderful. Very good. 
Uh, another question. What was Teresa's schedule like? Well, you can imagine. Not only did she write her spiritual works, I think I think the um, interior castle only took about six months, but she did this in between other things. And um, often she was up very late at night handling correspondence. So in that day, she managed things with letters. And some of the people who were against the reform would steal the letters. And plus, she used code names for um, for the people that she was writing to. I think Gracian maybe was was Paul, if I remember correctly, because she didn't. If someone intercepted the letter, she didn't want them to get in trouble with the various authorities. So um, the letters were sent by mule. Often she made like several copies of letters and sent them by different mule mule carriers, so that um, if if one you know set of mail was lost or whatever, the other one would get there. Um, so correspondence was was a large part of her activity, but then also she traveled a lot. So um, and she wasn't uh, she wasn't in very good health much of the time. She traveled on uh, it, by mule uh, in these you know mule caravans, if you will, and sometimes in bad weather. And um, so she was uh, busy wanting to go in person or needing to go in person to establish the various uh, various monasteries in the different towns. And then combine that with the administrative duties and really thinking about how the monastery should be governing, should be governed, and writing down the governance in those documents that we mentioned. Um, all of that work, plus uh, the correspondence, as we mentioned, and then daily prayer. Uh, the, the goal is for Carmelites, you know, two, two hours a day, um, secular Carmelites, a half hour of mental prayer a day, and then the uh, divine office. Um, liturgy of the hours, morning and evening prayer, and I don't know which other prayers they said during the day, certainly probably midday prayer and night prayer, and office of readings, one would think, honestly, I don't know for sure, but that would have been the plan. And, um, you know, and then welcoming new, I'll say personnel, new members to the, to the order, um, being sure they're settled. Um, in, in my language, we would call that onboarding, you know, someone giving them the kind of the kind of rules of the road and, and how to be successful and um, getting them settled and, and uh, you know, building the relationships with the community and so forth. So she had a very, very busy schedule. And this this did have an effect on her health many times. So thank you for that question. Oh, very good. Uh, we have another question from Paul. Have the discalced monasteries remained in separate provinces? Have the discalced monasteries remained in separate provinces? In the United States, we have the Washington province, which covers the eastern part of the country. And then there's a California, Arizona province. I think those used to be two separate provinces, and I believe they are now combined into one province for the western part of the country. The rest of the world, I don't know much about. But I would assume there would be separate provinces for each of the, you know, countries or parts of countries or groups of countries, uh, similarly to how we have that in the United States. The secular Carmelites, um, the Theresian seculars, do fall under under those provincial uh, boundaries as well. So I am a member of a community in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, that is a part of the Mid-Atlantic region of the Washington province. And so uh, have, they have they remained in separate provinces? I believe the answer would be yes. Oh, I, I think you might be asking whether the discalced is still separate from the original Carmelites of the ancient observance. That's what you're asking. Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Very, very strong, strongly yes. Although everybody's cooperating better these days than from 500 years ago. Um, and there are uh, conferences, in fact, the, a talk similar to this one was given. There's the Carmelite Institute of North America that includes leadership from both provinces, uh, both, uh, would we say provinces? Both orders. I think they, we really need to consider them as separate orders, but they're Carmelite, they're both Carmelite. Um, but the leadership for the Carmelite Institute of North America does include leadership from both both groups. So um, there's a lot, there's great cooperation among, among them uh, these days, but yes, they are separate. I believe the correct term would be orders. Uh, yes. Yep. Thanks for asking that question. Great question. 
Very interesting. Very interesting. We have about five minutes left before we close, and I don't have any more questions for you, but if you would like to share anything else, you're more than welcome to. Um, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to give this presentation and to share with all of you. I'm just grateful that you all have come, and um, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I think it is a challenge for us to um, practice our spiritual lives you know, in in the different settings that we find ourselves, um, whether they be religious or, or secular. And hopefully some of these um, areas that we've looked at today can, can highlight how the uh, administrative and governance aspects of our, of our spiritual growth really do play a role. And so, um, you know, at the very least, we can have a sense of gratitude for the people that are behind the scenes in our in our churches and in our and in our convents and in our you know Catholic school system and everything else that that help to provide that framework and all of the details that go into establishing any kind of organization to promote the Catholic faith and um, our own spiritual growth. So that's that's really all I have to say. But thank you thank you again so much for inviting me. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Olson. We do have one more question. It came from Julie Butler. Okay. Uh, she says, thank you for your wonderful presentation, very thought-provoking and so important to highlight functional and business aspects of not only her spirituality, but to be successful in the reform. It's just interesting how many people she worked with in order to make these changes. How do you think she was able to maintain her focus despite her health and peer resistance? You know, I think uh, poverty, chastity, and obedience following the evangelical councils as, as, as well as she could um, was, was really important to her. And I would say that obedience, uh, she writes about obedience and how important that was to her, that she would, someone at one point um, gave her the book of her life to the, to the uh, in, Inquisition uh, tribunal that would review these things. And someone asked her, are you worried about that? She said, oh, no, not at all. Anything they want to tell me, I'll change, you know. She, she really was a daughter of the church, and that sense of obedience, I think, freed her from um, worrying so much about what people thought. And she was able to, I think, handle the resistance because she felt like she was truly in line with the church reforms that were going on in that day. She was re wanting to return the Carmelite order to greater, uh, you know, greater adherence to um, sanctity, if you will, to the development of holiness. And and the, the original Carmelite rule and her understanding of being true true to God and true to her superiors, uh, you know, freed her from any kind of pro protest or anything like that, any kind of uh, adversarial relationship with with her superiors. So to me, I've I've always been impressed by that when I read about Teresa's uh, life and her work. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much uh, for everyone for your questions. And I'm going to send it back to Dr. Sebastian Mahfoud. And he will close the webinar and then we will go to our closing prayer. Very cool. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you, Christina. Um, this wraps up our Q&A. Uh, I'd like to thank as well everyone um, for their participation in today's webinar. So our closing prayer will be offered by Julie Butler. Currently a candidate in the Pontifex University Theology Doctoral Program and in the University of Steubenville Spiritual Direction Program. Julie has completed an MA in Theology at Holy Apostles College and Seminary and a BS in Speech Communications at the University of Utah. Julie, uh, please send us home. Dear God, please be with us today and thank you so much for that beautiful presentation and i would like to end it with uh saint Teresa of avila's prayer let nothing disturb you let nothing frighten you all things are passing away god never changes patience obtains all things whoever has god lacks nothing god alone suffices in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.